Thank you very much, everyone. That's quite of a crowd. Um, I'm, I'm more impressed and I'm happy right now, but uh, hopefully this will pass. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, having invited me. I'm, I'm actually extremely honored uh, to be here, and all the more honored that I'm not at all an expert in language, which is quite of a challenge uh, for me. Uh, I, my, most of my work was dedicated to uh, visual processing, uh, but I do see these two fields of cognitive neuroscience as sharing very strong uh, and similar kind of challenges. Right? In both cases, as you know, what we're trying to find out is how the brain takes a raw input, which could be an audio waveform or a visual image, and applies onto this raw input a series of operations which will eventually lead to meaningful representations. Right? And to some extent, we, we do believe that uh, these kind of operations can be mapped down to some uh, brain regions, largely in a feedforward manner uh, in most of the models that we've been developing. All right, so the common goal, as you know, is to identify this algorithm, this, this sequence of operations that transform this raw data into meaningful representations. But still, we are dealing with specific challenges in language that we do not uh, face in other or the fields of cognitive neuroscience. And one of the uh, challenges that uh, we face, and that this has been uh, raised by Angela, which it relates to the structure of language. So what do I mean by this? Well, let's take an example. When I say, I saw Angela with a telescope, um, probably most of you, when you hear the sentence, you're building a representation of the following form, where I, the narrator, saw Angela through or with a telescope, right? But this meaning, this representation, is actually non-trivial at all. It's not necessarily uh, deep down encoded in this, uh, in this set of stimuli that I presented you with. You could have un understood the sentence in a different way. For instance, you could have understood this kind of representations where I saw Angela and this, there happened to be a telescope next to her. So what's the difference between these two sentences? Well, in one case, you're linking or you're binding the constituent with a telescope to the action phrase, I saw Angela. And in the other case, you link this constituent with a telescope to the noun Angela directly. And the reason why uh, we're dealing with a very specific kind of structure in language is not just because it's a link, but this link, this type of link at least, is nested. That is that each constituent in a sentence can be made of subconstituents of the same nature. So by if, if your brain builds such kind of constituents, he has to recursively uh, create multiple subtrees. And this kind of operation, we believe, is probably something specific to the language domain as opposed to <coughs> vision or other uh, functions in cognitive neuroscience that we study. Right, the other big challenge that we face is the fact that language uh, intrinsically linked to time. So we cannot, unlike images, we cannot present a sentence uh, at once. We have to unfold it over time. And when I read to you or when I, when I speak, what I'm really doing is I'm bombarding you with a very fast series of phonemes that your brain has to decode, integrate, and build words out of it. Right, so how, we, how can we address these two big uh, challenging challenges? Uh, I'll try to argue for a case um, which is related to temporally resolved neuroimaging techniques, and I'll specifically focus on magnetoencephalography, uh, which is hopefully will be uh, something which will resonate with Angela's uh, talk. And I'll try to show you how we can use some simple machine learning techniques to try to decode the type of signals we get from MEG uh, activity, to try to make sense out of them. All right, so at the end of the talk, I will, I will actually present you with some, some examples coming from language. Um, but before I, I do so, and before I, we deal with these sort of complex cases, I wanted to start uh, with a simpler use case, actually coming from vision, where we just present one stimulus at a time, just to sort of lay out the framework and how we can start to reason about it. So in this, in this study, what we wanted to do is very simple. We presented the, probably the most boring stimulus that we invented in the field, which is gabble patches. Um, and we, we just flashed it on the screen and we asked subjects to uh, provide us with a very simple behavior, which is a visibility inference. We asked subjects to tell us how visible the stimulus that was presented on the screen was. And for, to make it more or less visible, we actually use a backward masking task. 
and that tends to make the stimulus uh, less visible. And the big aim in this, in this study is to try to unravel this sequence of operation that the brain can potentially perform to uh, transform this raw input into, uh, in this case, a visibility inference. So we took uh, this kind of protocol to the MEG scanner. And the kind of uh, signals that we obtain is typically a topography. This is uh, a view from the sensor space, where you have the back of the brain over here and you have the front over here. And a very simple analysis that you can do is to try to contrast the activity you get when there is a target on the screen, as opposed to when uh, you don't have a target, but you still have a mask and you still have the same question. And when you do so, you have this kind of brain response or MEG response, which is sort of growing at the back of the brain, probably coming from the visual cortex. And this is known as a mass univariate analysis, but what a lot of people are doing now is try to generalize this method and, and apply a decoding analysis, which is basically trying to identify the pattern of MEG activity, which will predict that there is a target presented on the screen. All right, so you fit what we call a hyperplane, it's a linear model, across all dimensions that uh, the sensor space uh, defines in a given time point. And if you do this, you can estimate the uh, decoding score, the decoding accuracy at that time point. Then you can uh, fit a different classifier at a different time point. So you try to extract a different MEG pattern. Again, you get a different score. And if you do this systematically, you can basically estimate, estimate a decoding score over time. <coughs> right? Very simple. So in this case, this is a binary classification. Is there a target on the screen, yes or no? But this linear modeling approach is very generic. We can try to apply it to decode, for instance, the orientation of the, of the grating that was on the screen. We can also decode the contrast of the stimulus, its spatial frequency, its phase. We can also decode the visibility uh, decisions reported by the subject. And in fact, in this task, the protocol was slightly more complex. We had multiple stimuli. And the, the main point of this figure is really to try to convince you that MEG signals are extremely rich and that we can track, track and decode many representations at once in parallel uh, using these simple decoding techniques. But still, uh, this decoding approach to uh, MEG or, or tem temporarily resolved neuroimaging techniques is limited. Um, and the reason for which it's limited is uh, because it doesn't actually tell us the algorithm or the set of operations that were applied onto the neural representations. So what do I mean by this? It's a bit dense. So let's take an example. These are three architectures, three computational architectures that you can think of as different algorithms or are different, as different types of neural systems. And each of them encodes the information in different ways. So for instance, you can imagine that we flash uh, a visual stimulus onto the eye, and perhaps the uh, information is propagated from the retina directly to the early visual cortex, and the early, cortex, early visual cortex would maintain the information uh, over there and do not do anything with it. One type of architecture, which we call sustain in this case. Well, this is very different from a feed-forward neural network, where the information is propagating from one processing stage to the next, or from one area to the next, in a transient manner. And again, this is very different from a recurrent system where the activity is sort of spinning around or iterating multiple times in a few, a few number of, a small number of processing stages. And the issue that we face is that each of these architectures are actually compatible with this decoding score over time because we fitted a classifier at each time point separately. So as long as there is a coding activity, we would be able to decode uh, information from these MEG signals. But what we can do is try to see whether the classifier trained at one time point is able to generalize to other time samples. Right? So you fit a classifier, let's say, at time t2, and you try to see whether this classifier, this pattern of MEG activity, is useful to predict the presence of the target at other time samples, let's say time t1 and time t3. And if you do this systematically, you end up with uh, what we call a temporal generalization matrix, which is uh, Defined as the following, on the y-axis you have the training time, and on the x-axis you have testing time, and the value codes for the decoding performance. And this is a very useful kind of analysis because now the temporal generalization matrix that you obtain for each network is very specific. So in this case, let's take the example of the feed-forward network. You end up with a diagonal uh, temporal generalization matrix. Because if you train a classifier at one time point, you're basically looking at one pattern of activity, and therefore this classifier will not be able to cross-generalize uh, 
to other time samples. And if you train the classifier at a different time point, you will also not be able to generalize to other time samples. You're only targeting one processing stage at the time, and each of them is transient. Right, in, this, in the case where the stimulus or the representation is maintained in a given region or in a given processing stage, you end up with a square matrix because you're basically looking at the same pattern of activity across all time samples. And again, I'll let you sort of imagine how you can generalize this approach to any kind of network and see how you end up with specific temporal generalization matrices. Right, so what, what is actually great with this kind of data is that uh, they can be thought as neural network. And I think uh, uh, Daniel uh, Bassett will, will probably uh, talk, talk to us about it uh, later on. So these temporal generalization matrices can be thought as a uh, network, and therefore we can plot them as network. In other words, we have a, an analysis that directly takes the MEG signals and reconstructs the network that corresponds to the algorithm that we're trying to look for. So does this work? Well, let's try to uh, see what we ended up with uh, our data. Again, we were trying to predict the presence of the target. Very simple stimulus on the screen. This is a decoding score that we obtain. And this is a temporal generalization matrix that we uh, estimate that we can plot in the following way, where each of the dots corresponds to a processing stage or a classifier. And we can now unfold it over time, see when each, wait, when each um, processing stage is activated. And you'll see that the activity is very fastly transient uh, fastly propagating in the network early on, and later on it's much more sustained, but still continues to unfold uh, across multiple processing stages. All right, so in other words, as I said, we have a simple analysis that uncovers the hierarchy of visual processing stages um, directly from temporally resolved new imaging. So actually introduce you to, with to two uh, concepts in computation or uh, architectures of computations, which is the concept of parallel, pro uh, parallel processing, the idea that we can decode multiple representations at once, and the idea of hierarchies, uh, which is this idea that each representation can be changed uh, in a sequential manner over time. Using the same types of technique, we can uh, go uh, and, and try to test other forms of computational architectures, like serial processing, but I see that I'm already running out of time, so I won't actually uh, speak about it. I'll focus on recursion. So in recursion, um, we are uh, dealing with something which is very important for language, because as I said before, when we speak, when we present, when we present it with a sentence, we have to reconstruct a data structure, which is a tree, and this data structure is nested because each of the elements of the tree is of the same type, which means that we need to have an algorithm that iteratively reconstructs multiple uh, of these branches uh, at multiple times. So how, we, how do we do this? Well, there exist parsers coming from uh, computational linguistics that tells us um, potential predictions on how uh, the brain could, could, could construct such a, such a tree. So this is an animation of such a parser in this case. This is a, a bottom-up parser where um, you have two main uh, elements or two main operations. Uh, one is in blue, this is called the stack, and one is in red, this is called the merge operation that Angela uh, mentioned. And the idea is that basically you have to listen to multiple words in sequence, and as long as you cannot bind them or merge them together, you have to uh, put them in a stack. So in other words, we have an algorithm or we have a model that tells us what kind of operation should the brain be uh, doing if you were to implement this kind of uh, operations. So in other words, what we can do is we can use these models to uh, try to predict MEG activity. We can use these models as regressors. And just to try to convince you that this is um, something that may work, I'll just show you some preliminary evidence from a single subject that we recorded last week. The, the task was very simple. Uh, subjects were presented to natural stories. And we knew everything about the uh, audio content, so we could try to see whether we could decode phonemes from the MEG signals, and we could. We can also try to decode the type of word that was presented, whether it was a noun, a determinant, a verb, and so forth. But importantly, we could try to see whether we could decode the operations that are predicted by the syntactical parsers, and we can also um, do this with MEG analysis. And now we're in a great situation, because uh, we can really track the unfolding of multiple processing stages using this simple technique. Uh, 
and potentially we can start to uh, use them to answer deep questions in linguistics. And I'll just mention one of them. In the case of the sentence that I presented you with, I described the syntax with this kind of tree, which is uh, in uh, linguistics known as a context-free grammar kind of syntax. But there exist many uh, debates in the field of linguistics on how we should uh, describe the structure of language. There exist multiple types of representations that have been put forward. And uh, I think now with uh, new imaging uh, techniques, we can start to uh, try to provide new answers to these uh, long-lasting debates and see whether the brain actually implements this kind of structures and this kind of algorithm. And perhaps one of the most exciting directions uh, on that matter comes from the development in machine learning where a lot of people are developing models that are not necessarily bounded to, uh, to the questions of linguistics, but still make very strong predictions on how you should uh, combine words together to generate meaning, and we could potentially use them as potential regressors to explain brain activity. Right, I'll just finish with this. I hope I uh, convince you that this is a great framework uh, with which we can, we can uh, try to unravel the uh, computations or the algorithm of language processing and more generally of human cognitions. Uh, and I will just make a small advertisement to say that if you, uh, if you uh, want to try this analysis, they're actually implemented in open source packages. Uh, they're very easy to, to try with your EEG or your MEG or ECOG data. And I'll just finish with uh, thank thanking my collaborators and you for your attention.